Okay, so this is going to be a tag off of a message that we started uh, this last Wednesday, and we're going to continue this coming Wednesday. And the way this message began was uh, uh, immediately after family camp, uh, which the Lord granted us great victory and really spoke to us about how to cultivate the anointing and the power and the presence of God. Uh, and we're most certainly going to do those things that we discussed at family camp. We immediately realized that this church was falling under satanic attack. We saw family after family, household after household being attacked full force, front, frontal assault by the enemy. And uh, I was with uh, uh, my... Uh, uh, friend Greg Hood who pastors the church down the street on Tuesday and uh, I was just mentioning man pray for our church we are under attack and he just said oh man brother you're gonna need the hedge and right away my mind was like the hedge uh, I have not heard about the hedge of thorns of God for the 20 years I've been four square it's just not part of their culture it's not part of their dialogue and I just never heard the term even mentioned it's been out of my mind for a while but when I was Assemblies of God, uh, it is something that every single church taught. It was foundational for the pastoral staff to be, uh, staff to be praying the hedge of thorns over the church. The elder board would come together every single week in prayer, praying and discerning the will of God, and they would pray for the hedge of thorns around the church. Every single father, every single husband, every single boss, every single manager, every single older brother uh, was encouraged within the AG to pray the hedge of thorns of God. Now, question... What is the hedge of thorns? So this is, uh, uh, in some ways, review of what we talked about on uh, Wednesday, but we're going to flesh it out a little bit more. In Job chapter 1, what we find is Lucifer, Satan, uh, invading heaven and standing before the throne of God. And uh, 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 God sees him and says, what the heck are you doing here? And you know, he says, I'm just moving, you know, I'm chilling, I'm moving around. Uh, and God looks at him and says, Have you considered my servant Job? He is righteous in all his ways. He is upright. He praises me. He prays. He worships. You know, he, he, he glorifies me. And here's where Satan, I don't normally look to Satan to be a source of uh, spiritual knowledge. But since he is talking to God and God could slap him down and say that's not true. Uh, 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 and God tolerates and actually uh, parlays with, with, with Satan in, in this case, uh, I believe what he's saying reveals spiritual fact. He says, yeah, of course Job praises you. Of course Job worships you. Of course Job is upright. Of course Job glorifies you. Have you not put your hedge around him? And we find in Proverbs 15, 19, Hosea 2, 6, Micah 7, 4, that what he's talking about is something called the hedge of thorns. Uh, the Hebrew word for it is metsuka. Say that with me. Metsuka. One more time. Metsuka. And what that is is a protective barrier, a living hedge that is a spiritual reality that surrounds Job. And I want you to take a look now in Scripture as to what the hedge of thorns does. Satan is saying, uh, have you not made a, your hedge around him around his household and around all that he has so this hedge of thorns that God has surrounded Job with surrounds Job surrounds his household surrounds his his house surrounds everything he owns and serves to bless the work of his hands and bring about and cause increase on everything that he has now that having been said how many of you not only want but need God's hedge of thorns around you and your household say amen so that the Lord knows amen 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 the uh, uh, hedge of thorns is around Job and is around his household his house the Hebrew word for uh, the house is be'yith and basically uh, when the hedge of thorns is something that protects your house or your household. The word beyeth basically means that which is beneath or that which is between. In other words, everything that you have authority over, everything that you have influence over, everything that you are in charge of, 
a man's wife or wives at the time, all his children, concubines, children, everything that he owns, everything in the house, his servants, everything within the scope of his household. And not only that, but we're also talking about uh, 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 blessing the work of his hands. So this has to do with where he works. Not just where he lives, but also where he works. The people that he knows, his scope or, uh, uh, or frame of influence that he has been put into, all these things are now surrounded by a hedge of thorns. And this, this is a spiritual reality that carries with it carnal consequence. How many of you know when God moves in the spiritual sense, it transforms what happens here, amen? So the real world is affected by, and clearly we can see this. He's talking about the household. He's talking about everything he owns. He's talking about the work and the labor of his hands. So this extends beyond just spiritual application. This is carnal reality that is based upon spiritual power that God is releasing from his throne that surrounds Job. Now a hedge is different from a wall. A wall is static. A wall does not move. A wall cannot grow bigger. It can only over time deteriorate. And once you build up a wall, a predator or a perpetrator can figure out a way, a way around the wall. A hedge, on the other hand, is a living thing. A hedge is a living thing that can be cultivated, that can be grown, that can become healthier, that can become bigger, that can become more effective. Uh, 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 and it, pursuant to that, uh, I, I'm not a hortic horticulturalist. I, 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 I don't have a green thumb. I have a black thumb. Uh, any plant uh, I'm put in charge of dies. Uh, maybe the hedge of thorns praying that will help me, but uh, I, I don't know. The, it will take God's miracle working power for me to cause any plant to live. Uh, but because I don't know how to take care of plants, I, I called my uh, brother-in-law, talked to my brother-in-law, Clayton, uh, and he's in charge of Kahala Mall and a bunch of other little strip malls uh, around uh, here, uh, little tiny strip malls like Pearl Ridge. Um, and uh, he understands plants. So I asked him, I said, uh, Clay, uh, uh, what's a thorny plant that we have here? Big, bushy, thorny plant. Everybody knows what it is, right? Bougainvillea. Uh, nobody likes trimming bougainvillea. Why? Because the second you try to touch it, you get all scratched up. So I asked him, I said, if I wanted to make a bougainvillea plant bigger, what would I do? He's like, why would you want to do that? I said, well, you know, if I want it to be like protection, if I want, he says, oh, okay, so you're talking about like for keep people out. I'm like, right. He goes, okay, if you want bougainvillea to grow, you just leave it on its own. Don't do anything. It'll probably stay about the same size. It'll grow really slowly. But he says, if you want the thing to explode, just water it. He says, you pour water, you water a bougainvillea, and the thing's going to grow really fat and really lush. And he said, and if you fertilize it, put kukai or whatever it is in, into the ground, he said, it, it'll make the bougainvillea grow high. So one thing, uh, nourishing it uh, will make it grow high. Uh, watering it will make it go thick and lush. Uh, if you really want to cultivate it, pull the weeds and take care of all that. I don't know how you get the weeds under a bougainvillea plant unless you wanted to sacrifice your arms and all the skin on it. But he said, those things, those things you could do. And he said, that would make the thing grow really, really big. So the hedge of thorns is something that is placed around Job, placed around you, placed around your household, placed around your house, placed around your family, placed around your friends, placed around your workplace. How many need this? Say amen again. Okay. Can you have it? Is this something that you can have? As a matter of fact, it is. Why don't some of you have it? Two reasons. Number one, you never ask for it. James chapter 4 says, you have not because what? You ask not. And the reason you didn't ask for it is partially my fault. I haven't taught on this a whole lot. Uh, 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 but now that you know about it, you are free to ask God, God, please surround me, please surround my house, my household, my friends, my family with the hedge of thorns. I want to take a look at what that does and what that accomplishes this morning. What does the hedge of thorns accomplish? There's a hedge of thorns around you. Hedge of thorns around Job. What does it serve to do? Number one, to keep the enemy out. To prevent Satan from attack. 
if you take if you take a look at the dialogue in Job chapter 1 the reason that Satan did not like the hedge of thorns he hated the hedge of thorns had nothing to do with the fact Shalai, that Job was rich Satan doesn't care how rich Job is Satan doesn't care how many wives Job has Satan doesn't care how much property he has Satan doesn't could care less how many cows he owns what Satan doesn't like is that Job is praising God, serving God, worshiping God, and he, Satan, cannot get at him. He cannot get at him. Satan's reality is this. When God sets up his hedge of thorns, Satan cannot penetrate that. And that's what Satan doesn't like. And that's when I realized for every single family, for every single person, for every single person connected with CCI, that Satan is trying to attack we need to pray God's hedge of thorns surround them and that is something that Satan can't penetrate. Number two purpose that the hedge of thorns serves is to keep the sheep in. Now, the Bible says that your enemy, the devil, and he's your enemy, not God's enemy. Everybody thinks that Satan is God's enemy. He's not. Satan can't do a thing to God. He cannot attack God. He cannot hurt God. He can do nothing to God. Satan is not God's enemy. Satan's your enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking to tear you apart, tear your children apart, tear your friends apart, tear your workplace apart. You are his enemy. You are his target. You're the one that is under attack and you're the one that can be surrounded by God's protective hedge of thorns that serves not only to keep him out, but also to keep the sheep in. Now, how does the hedge of thorns keep the sheep in? We see how it keeps the enemy out. If he's like a, ro a roaring lion, well, the lion can tap at a wall, he can bounce in a wall, he can try to climb over a wall. Guess what? Lion cannot penetrate a, a hedge of thorns, especially a thick one. Predators cannot get through that because the second that they do, first of all, a predator walks up to a hedge of thorns, let's say a lion, and he sees that it's a gargantuan bush of thorns, he's not going to want to touch it. Well, maybe because he really wants to get the sheep inside, he will pat at it. What is the, what is the lion going to feel if he pats at the hedge of thorns? He's going to he's going to feel the thorns he's going to feel poked by it and if he rams his head into it if he tries to let's see how do lions attack claw at something or they try to bite it what happens to a lion if he tries to bite a big huge bunch of the thorn bush not going to feel very good right same thing is true of the sheep on the inside let's say the sheep wants to get out let's say the sheep wants to escape the hedge of thorns well first of all the hedge of thorns is going to look daunting to the little sheep as well. See, here's the sheep and here's the hedge of thorns. And, you know, sheep is going to have a hard time getting through there. And if the sheep tries to go up to the hedge and poke his little head in it, boom, 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 he's going to get poked. He's going to get uh, 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 pierced. And if he tries to run into the hedge or try to break through it, he's going to get lacerated all over. Now, that's what God will do to somebody who is within his hedge of thorns. He will not only keep the perpetrator out, but he will try to keep the sheep in. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, and how many people do you know need protection from the enemy and also from themselves? Say amen. Maybe you're one of those people, amen? Okay, so in Hosea chapter 2, verse 6, Hosea the prophet is told by God to marry, basically marry a hooker, and she continues to sleep around with a whole bunch of guys and this hurts Hosea and he is heartbroken over it. And so he prays to God and here's what God says he is going to do to Hosea and to his wife Gomer. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up as a couple. I will hedge up your way with thorns. And this is what it accomplishes. And make a wall so that she will not find her paths. She will not find her paths. Let me read it further she will pursue her lover she's going to want to get out of the hedge but she will not reach them and she will seek them but will not find them then she will say i will go and return to my first husband for it was better for me then than it is now Ooh. so we have a child that is wayward we have a husband or a wife who is wayward we have friends who are venturing away from god 
We have church people venturing away from God, not just, by the way, in physical sense, Linda. I'm not talking about just going to a drug pusher or going to some sort of a, a strip bar or something like that. I'm talking about mentally, in their mind, they're venturing from God, entertaining imagery and entertaining thoughts and entertaining uh, things in their mind or in their heart, harboring anger, harboring frustration, harboring bitterness not willing to give it up. All these places that we want to go to, not only physically, but in our head and in our heart and spiritually venturing into the wrong places. The hedge of thorns of God keeps them in to where Gomer could not get to her lovers, could not get to the place of sin, but the hedge of thorns held it in. This God did for Hosea, not necessarily for Gomer. Gomer still wanted to go. She still had a rebellious heart against her husband and against the laws of God. But because of Hosea, and because of Hosea's prayers, the hedge of thorns surrounded Gomer as well. You can pray the hedge of thorns around your husband and your wife. You can pray the hedge of thorns around your children. You can pray the hedge of thorns around your family and your household. And I got news for you. Since we have been praying this way since Wednesday, we have seen, have we not, Pastor Matt, miracles happening in this church. I will testify, I, I have started a miracle list, right, of things that I have specifically seen since Tuesday when I started studying this and then Wednesday when we started preaching about it that God has specifically done that reveals him moving in the hedge of thorns now how can we decipher when God moves in the hedge of thorns is there an example of God using a hedge of thorns as a matter of fact I think there is and let's briefly look at it so you understand how the hedge of thorns actually works to hold the sheep in and to bring them back into the fold. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, we find the parable of the prodigal son. Now there are many renewal theologists, theologians, excuse me, who believe that the father of the prodigal son was praying the hedge of thorns over his, his child simply because it was part standard part of Hebrew culture at the time. And any time you were a father, or any time you were in charge of, of, of a whole bunch of stuff, it was common for a Jew to pray for God to surround himself and his household and his family with the hedge of thorns. This is common stuff. It's foundational to their, prayer, to their prayer method. So it is logical to assume that the father of the prodigal son would be praying the hedge of thorns around not only him and his household, but also his son. Take a look. In Luke chapter 15, let's start with verse 10 because we know the story pretty well. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, who repents. The reason I included that verse is you need to understand something about your children. You need to understand something about your spouse, your friends, your family members, the people you work with and yourself it is God's will that people repent from sin when people are invested in sin and invested in rebellion against God and they're turned against God it is God's will to pray that they return from that sin it is God's will that they turn and repent from that rebellion God will use his power and in addition to that his hedge of thorns as we just saw in the case of Hosea and Gomer to bring lost sheep home. And that's why I included uh, verse 10. Now, it goes on to say, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me a share of the estate. So he divided the property, the father did, between his, the two sons. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So the son is executing his legal right, you really shouldn't do this, is a rebellion against the dad, but because the father had instituted certain trust documents and, and certain contracts that enabled his son to have access to uh, uh, half of his estate, the son took advantage of this, as sometimes you know families do. This is why I try to advise people, don't do business with family, because generally speaking, the relationship will be tested severely and, and, and somebody will wind up being real honked off at somebody else because, you know, 
uh, they'll do things and they'll just shrug and go, it's just business. Yeah, but when it's between family members, it winds up becoming more than just business and it becomes a real offense and drives wedges between people. So generally speaking, I, I advise people, number one, don't do business with family and number two, uh, uh, keep commerce out of the church because it generally speaking, it just muddies the water. But anyway, this is what he did and he squanders his wealth in wild living and after he spent everything, how much did he spend? Half of the estate, gone. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. He began to be in need. Who put him there? Who allowed the famine to take place? Who allowed him enough latitude to spend all his money? God did. Why? To what end? It, co it goes on to say, he began to be in need. He was so humbled and so decimated by what God allowed to happen to him, he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. Now, you and I slopping pigs is no big deal, but to a Jew, it's horrible. To Jews, pigs are unclean animals. So, anybody ever see that show, uh, 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 what is it, Most Horrible Jobs? What is it? Dirty, world's dirtiest jobs if you've ever seen that you got a clean sewer you got to shovel out live cockroaches or do something horrible like that or you know you got to you got to pick up all these rats or, or spiders and throw them in a bag or something well that's tantamount to what he was it's the only job he could get so now here he is a jewish boy away from home he's offended his father he's offended his family he's decimated the estate he has hurt his family. Now he spent it all, and God let him do it. God let him be stupid enough to do this to a certain end. Now he is in need. God let him be in need. And let me tell you something. When you sin against God and you rebel against God, God will sometimes give you enough line. I know people, even in this very church, who are in rebellion to God in a certain, in a certain way, shape, or form. And it seems like, wow, they're like lost to God. They're like lost to fellowship. I got news for you. God is just giving you line. He's just letting you take line and drift out and out and out and out. And all the stuff that's happening to you, he's letting happen to you because he's going to use it to bring you back into fellowship with him. He began to be in need. He went out and hired himself to assist in that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods Carob pods is what they were, uh, uh, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And so what he winds up doing to not draw it out is, he realizes, why am I going to do this when in my father's house even the servants have food and food to spare? I am no longer fit to be his son. So now take a look. And this is exactly what God needs to have happen. And this is exactly what the, thorn, uh, the hedge of thorns will do, given time. He will take the pride, the arrogance, the attitude of sin and rebellion that that son has, and he will transform it into one of humility. Where this son, who would not accept authority and didn't want anybody in charge of him, I am not going to let anybody tell me what to do anything. I am not going to put up with that because of what happens and the hedge of thorns that God uses with his power. The attitude changes. The heart changes in the way that it has to. To where now the son is humbled and is not only willing to accept the authority of God, but the authority of his father and his leadership as well. And now he goes humbly and says, I'm not willing, I'm, I'm not worthy to be called your son, but just give me the servant's job. Just let me work in your field like any other hired hand, and I'm going to be fine. And we all know the story. The father gives him a ring and puts shoes on his feet and a robe on him and welcomes him back. But the point I'm trying to make is this. This is the way the hedge of thorns works. And you can see when you begin to pray the hedge of thorns around yourself and your household and your house and your workplace, God beginning to do miracles to not only prevent the enemy from coming in, but also to prevent the sheep from venturing out. 
Now, that in mind, how many people see the need for the hedge of thorns in their house, in their family? Can you pray for it? Because I will tell you this, I am praying for it for this church. I'm praying for it for the families of this church. I want you praying for it, not only over yourself. I need you praying it over your family members. I need you praying it over the people that are here. I need you praying it over me. How many will say amen, Pastor Wendell? I will be praying the hedge of thorns over you and your family this week. Say amen. Please do it because I need the protection of God. I need the protection of God. Can one person make a difference? Cool, let me ask you. Can just you pray transform the power of God and the way it surrounds Shalai and Kaipo and the way it affects you? How profoundly can you affect that? How, how profoundly can that be done? All right, take a look. First thing you need to understand, I got like five minutes left. First thing you need to understand about the hedge is it can be grown and it can be cultivated. It can be made, it can not only be placed someplace, but it can become bigger. In Ezekiel chapter 13, God is speaking to the prophets of Israel. And he is looking to judge Israel. And he knows Israel is going to be attacked by the enemy. And he says in Ezekiel 13, 4 and 5, O Israel, your prophets are like the foxes in the ruins. They're godly, but they're not doing any good. Blake, they're not doing any good. In fact, basically, like foxes in the ruins, what God is saying is, the prophets, the ones who are supposed to be believers, you're doing more harm than good. Why? What on earth is the leadership, spiritual leadership, the prophets of Israel doing that makes them in God's sight Maybe they're still honored by people. Maybe they're still looked up by people. But in God's sight, they are doing more harm than good. Why? He goes on to say, because you have not gone up into the gaps, nor did you, here's the line, build the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle, in, in the day of the battle. So we can take two things from this. Number one, the hedge can be built up. We can pray and ask for the hedge to be built up. We can ask for it to be seeded, sown, placed there, and then we can, we can do things that will build the hedge up. Now, this is a call to all the leadership, and that's why all the pastoral staff of this church is supposed to be praying for you. The elder board is supposed to be praying for you. Your pastor is supposed to be praying for you, and we are. But what about you? Can one person make a difference? In Ezekiel chapter 22, as things progress with Israel and more judgment is coming because of their continued rebellion, God speaks in, in chapter 22, verse 30. He said, God speaking now, I sought for a man among them. Sought for what? What's he looking for? What's he looking for, Ari? A group? Is he looking for a bunch? Is he looking for a squad? Is he looking for a battalion? Is he looking for a company? What does it say in there? I search for what? One man, one guy. I sought for one man to stand in the gap and build up the hedge for the entire nation of Israel is the context. That means, Sue, that a single woman's prayer, a single man's prayer can transform not only the spiritual warfare of an entire country, an entire nation, but build the hedge up around that nation. Now, if one single person like, Isaac, uh, like Ezekiel can build up the hedge around the nation of Israel, God is looking for one person in this case that would just stand there and stand in the gap and build the hedge. One person can make a difference. One person changes the way God applies his protection to an entire nation. You are that person over your family. You are that person over your children. Now you have not because you ask not. This morning you're going to ask. 
if you've never done it before or you haven't done it for a while, the hedge can come down. The hedge can be destroyed. You are your own worst enemy when it comes to the destruction of the hedge. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 8 says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoever so breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Satan cannot get through the hedge at you, but you can actually break through the hedge if you really, really try. So the hedge can be broken down. How do we break down the hedge? We're going to talk about that on Wednesday night. So we know what not to do. This morning, I know what to do. You are the man. You are the one man that can pray in the name of Jesus the hedge of thorns around yourself. The hedge of thorns around your family. The hedge of thorns around your household. How many believe this to be true? Say amen. This is what the scripture says. Ye have not because ye ask not. Maybe you never prayed this before. But in two minutes, I'm going to lead you into a prayer that in faith, by the authority of the name of Jesus and the power of his blood, because the Bible says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. How many know that's true? Peter says uh, uh, in his first epistle that the eyes of the Lord watch the righteous and his ear is attentive to their prayer. Are you righteous? Well, here's the thing. Bible says that you have a righteousness that is apart from the law. You have a righteousness that is yours because of your faith in Jesus. According to Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Let me hear it. Let me hear it again. And you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. Raise your hand if you do. You are saved and you have a righteousness apart from the law. You can stand in the blood of Christ and say, Father, in the name of Jesus. That's what the name of Jesus means. This is not me, Carol, praying. This is not me, Daryl, praying. This is not me, Lahela, praying. This is me praying in the name of Jesus. This is me realizing on my own, I am not qualified to ask you for anything. But because Jesus has washed me clean and because he lived a perfect life for me in his name, I can now stand and ask for these things as though he were the one asking. So in the name of Jesus, you can ask for and receive the hedge of thorns that will surround you and your family and your friends and your workplace. And I will tell you this, by next Sunday, you, this same family, the same Ohana people, you will be coming in as I can, as certain people in this church can, just from Wednesday and testify, Pastor, I have seen the hedge of thorns working this week because God desires to see this happen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let me pray for you And if you are in agreement with what I'm praying, you just whisper amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe your word. I believe it is your will and desire that your righteous ones live within the hedge of thorns to protect me from the attack of the enemy, to protect my family from the attack of the enemy, to protect my house and my household from the attack of the enemy to bless the work of my hands and to cause increase for everything I own. That's what the hedge does. And it also keeps me in, keeps me in Christ, keeps me in fellowship with you. So I ask in the name of Jesus, Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of his blood, set about me and my family and my house and household your hedge of thorns in Jesus' name. If I have torn it down, Lord, let it rebuilt, be, be rebuilt now. Raise it up, Lord. Surround me with it. In the name of Jesus, surround my family. In the name of Jesus, surround my house. In the name of Jesus, surround my household. In the name of Jesus, surround my workplace. In the name of Jesus, bless the work of my hands. In the name of Jesus, cause my possessions to increase. In this land, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for it. Now in the days to come, as you witness and as you testify of the effect of God's blessing and God's protection on you, you're going to water the hedge. 
Now I want you to listen to me for another 60 seconds and then I'm all done. You water the hedge by praying and praising and worshiping. When you refuse to pray or pray or, or, or praise the Lord or worship the Lord, what you're basically doing is you're withholding water from the hedge. But the more you worship and the more you pray and the more you praise him, the more living water gets poured out on that hedge. Two, you can nurture that hedge. Uh, nutrient, as we see it in, in scripture, is the word of God. As you read the word, as you learn the word, as you listen to the word, as you invest yourself in your knowledge and understanding and incorporation in the word of God, the hedge will grow higher. As you fellowship with other believers, as you invest yourself and not withdraw yourself from fellowship, but rather cultivate it and invest yourself in it, you will see the hedge of thorns grow bigger and become stronger and more effective. Thank you, Lord. We commit to doing these things and testifying of your miracles. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. See you on Wednesday.